this week on the Backtable Podcast. I manage all the staff. I hire and uh, unfortunately sometimes have to release some staff depending on, I actually had to do that a couple of weeks ago. It was a tough decision. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's a very good opportunity for someone like me who's young and three years out of fellowship and into an environment where I have to basically learn how to, you know, read P&L statements and balance sheets. And I'm like, you know, YouTubing, Googling, I'm reading books. And then at the same time, I'm reading leadership books to try to understand how to be a good leader, how to be effective, how to deal with different personalities. And um, you've had multiple podcasts with people talking about how IRs are just in the hospital doing A, B, and C, not worrying about anything else. And I didn't want to be that traditional IR. I wanted to incorporate my entrepreneurial drive and hunger that I had in the past before med school to bring it in and kind of combine it with medicine, but not take all the risk at the same time. So it was a nice balance for me to start this kind of process of assimilating these two skill sets. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a quick word from our sponsors. Treating peripheral artery disease can be challenging, especially cases with narrow lesions or complex anatomies. Medtronic's new FDA-approved Impact 018 drug-coated balloon is a low-profile DCB engineered to cross tight lesions in the SFA. Impact 018 DCB uses the same drug coding formulation as the market leading Impact Admiral DCB. It's compatible with 018 guide wires and comes in 130 centimeter and 200 centimeter catheter lengths, giving physicians the option to treat via radial or femoral access. Discover more at medtronic.com slash 018. Boston Scientific can help you advance, connect, and equip your practice with NextLab. NextLab is a suite of solutions and partnerships tailored to meet the needs of your OBL or cardiovascular ASC. NextLab goes beyond Boston Scientific's medical devices to provide ways to reduce expenses and increase efficiencies in your business so you can focus on patient care. Whether you have an established lab or you're thinking about opening one, Boston Scientific can help. Visit bostonscientific.com forward slash NextLab. And now back to the show. Today, we have a very special episode discussing the independent or solo IR practice. We've previously discussed practice styles and structures on prior episodes, including the pros and cons of the traditional IRDR practice, the strictly OBL or OBL and ASC practice. We've even had prior vascular surgeon slash IR practices on the show. But today, we're going to talk about interventional radiologist, Dr. Ali Alakani, about his solo IR practice how he got started with it, how it works, and is it lonely? You know, I was once there, I was solo for a little while, and I got to say it was it was a little lonely. I do like practicing alongside people, but I want to talk to you more about it. Welcome, Ali, to the show. Thank you. It's good to be on the show. It's my pleasure. So tell our audience where you trained, how long you've been in practice, and I know you've practiced in a few different practice styles. So before we get to where you are today, like what were those practice styles? Take us on that road. Yeah, so I did my residency at University of Tennessee and moved on to fellowship in IR at Brown University up in Rhode Island. I trained with some amazing people. I still keep in touch with most of them. Got some really good training. And then I joined a private practice outside of Washington, DC. I was there for about a year and a half. And that was a traditional private practice with call, but no diagnostic. It was 100% interventional radiology, which was great. It was a great learning experience for me. Worked with some really great people there as well. And then I moved up to Boston to a more hospital-based kind of IRDR practice. And I was there for almost two years. And then I got a phone call from a friend who said that his corporation actually has a OBL that is no longer hosting a physician and that physician has retired. So he said, it'd be a good opportunity for you to get your uh, kind of hands wet with the OBL game and offered me to join this practice. So I uh, came down and now I'm currently the medical director of this outpatient center, which is uh, right outside Baltimore. And it's a diversified center, do many different types of procedures and it's developing a lot more. So that's where I'm at now for the last three to four months. And before this practice, had you been in like an outpatient or OBL setting before, or it was all hospital-based? Never. Not even my hospital practice that they have an outpatient lab. So this was all very new. And so when you were contemplating doing this, and I think you and I talked about this before, did you have any like kind of 
you know, obviously you got concerned. It's a different practice style. You're on your own a little bit. Did you reach out to, you know, friends and colleagues and try and get some feedback on as to whether this is a good move for you? Yes, I did actually. I reached out to several IRs that I knew and most of them were supportive. Some were saying, oh, you're going to lose some skills if you go there and, you know, but those individuals didn't really talk about gaining some skills, which is what I was trying to focus on, kind of like the glass half full kind of thing. And I said, you know, I think it'd be a good option. So yes, that was definitely a risky, nerve wracking. I definitely was a little nervous for sure, especially being on my own and just being three years out of fellowship. So it was, but I definitely got lots of opinions, but I, at the end of the day, I made my own decision. Yeah. And when you started, did you take a break or was it like, did you start immediately I started immediately. Yeah, uh, I left my hospital-based practice, and within, I only had about four. I, mean, I had a four weeks four week transition. To transition but during yeah. those four weeks, it was pretty busy. Yeah, so it wasn't. But no, I just wanted to get started. I was anxious. Yeah, was there any extra training that you needed to do before you started? Like, go take a course in such and such. What did your new job say? Yeah, there was some in-house training by the practice itself. They sent me to different centers they have around the country to kind of see certain procedures and, you know, kind of refresh on a few things. So not formal training, but informal training where I was still doing cases on my own. And who were those docs that were training you? Were they cardiologists or? They were mostly interventional radiologists, some interventional nephrologists, but mostly IRs. Two vascular surgeons actually up in Staten Island, New York. So kind of a variety of doctors, but mostly endovascular specialists. Okay. And so, but not at this location, at other locations. Correct. Like Texas, uh, New York, and Philadelphia, yeah. Okay. So the practice flew you around to kind of get you some more training before you started. Correct. Yes. Okay. So let, tell us about this practice. You said it's OBL based. It's not really hospital based, but tell us about like the breadth of procedures that they were expecting you to cover when you came in. Was there any difference between what the expectations were with what reality was when you arrived? Uh, not really. It was so my role was to basically come in and diversify this one center. Most of these centers are they do mostly ESRD work and uterine fibroids and some PAD. And my kind of agenda was to come in and do more of everything for this practice and make it more profitable, and not only for, I guess, the governing bodies of the practice, but also for myself and also offer great patient care with my recent training and being a little bit more up to date on everything and all the techniques and literature. So that was kind of the picture we do uh, as far as procedures. There's, I do a lot of uterine fibroids. It's a very good market in the Baltimore area. I am starting to do more PAD. There is a, I'm pushing for prostate artery embolization, hemorrhoid artery embolizations, genicular artery embolizations. I want to do percutaneous ablations. If I can do some kyphoplasties, those are kind of tough to get on an outpatient setting. I could do that. So my goal is to do everything I like doing that can be done in an outpatient setting and not just focus on the ESRD or fibroids. And I think that's very well welcomed by the governing bodies of the practice, which I'm directing. You know. So I do have some questions about the procedure that you're doing, but first I want to ask you, so like, can you tell us a little bit about the company that hired you? So are you, are you a 1099 or are you W-2? I'm a W-2 employee. Yeah, it's, it's a W-2 employee. I could be 1099 if I go locum. So they do have an option to basically, um, there are physicians within the system that do mostly coverage. So when I want to go on vacation, they come in. So those are 1099. And that's, that's actually something I've been thinking about maybe in the future. But uh, currently I'm, I'm W-2. I'm five days a week. It's uh, eight to five. There's no call, no weekends, no nights. There's no coverage on the weekends and it's not mandatory, which is nice. The vacation is... Uh, Fairly generous. I think it's a little bit above average for OBLs. It's about six weeks for the year, PTO. The company itself, is it like a nationwide company and they have these outpatient centers? Yeah. So basically it's a large multi-billion dollar company. It has over 70 centers all over the US and it's basically a corp type job, which isn't really my favorite type of job. I mean, I left a corp type hospital job in Boston, but to me to get started and get my feet wet in the OBL ASC world, which is my center is actually an OBL and an ASC. I can flip the designations for different days. So it's actually very nice that I have that. It was a good opportunity. One of my mentors actually calls it entrepreneurship on helper wheels, where I'm the medical director. I make decisions. I have to review finances and care about budgets and learn all those things I never knew how to do. At the same time, I have a kind of a steady paycheck 
And as long as I do my job, I'm okay. So I can develop and develop and you know diversify further with procedures. Or if I have like a month that I'm not, or I we hit a slump with marketing or doctors are not referring to us as much, then I'm still okay with my pay. So I think that was a good start for me. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this was to test myself, see, can I do this? Am I going to enjoy this? And not take all the risk right away by opening up a center on my own. Yeah, that's great. It sounds like you get to learn what it's like to run an OBL because they expect you to help make those decisions. I imagine staffing has to do with that as well. I mean, you probably have to help. Select. Yes. So I manage all the staff I hire and unfortunately sometimes have to release some staff depending on, I actually had to do that a couple of weeks ago. It was a tough decision. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's a very good opportunity for someone like me who's young and three years out of fellowship and into an environment where I have to basically learn how to, you know, read PL statements and balance sheets. And I'm like, you know, YouTubing, Googling, I'm reading books. And then at the same time, I'm reading leadership books to try to understand how to be a good leader, how to be effective, how to deal with different personalities. Luckily for me, I have a sales and marketing background prior to medical school. So I'm a little bit more blessed in that sense that I'm okay in that environment, but definitely a lot more to learn. And I still reach out to, I have friends, for example, you know, Jason Anicelli, who's now an entrepreneur, you know, he's, I speak with him who was on your show not too long ago. And also some other friends I have that are in completely different industries who I consult with regarding how do I handle these situations? And I try to learn. And I think that's so important for me that most physicians in my stage don't have exposure to. And um, you've had multiple podcasts with people talking about how IRs are just in the hospital doing A, B, and C, not worrying about anything else. And I didn't want to be that traditional IR. I wanted to incorporate my entrepreneurial drive and hunger that I had in the past before med school to bring it in and kind of combine it with medicine, but not take all the risk at the same time. So it was a nice balance for me to start this kind of process of assimilating these two skill sets. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, reaching out to Jason and other colleagues and mentors, you know, about making decisions and whatnot. And I, I kind of touched at the very beginning or joked about it rather is that being alone, it can be tough, right? I mean, you were in a prior practice where you had colleagues you could reach out to and even have somebody scrub with you on a case, like if a ch and there's a challenging case, you're kind of out on your own island now. You don't really have that. Can you tell us about how that has maybe been challenging or has it been easy? And you're like, nah, I like being alone. I mean, some people enjoy being on their own. No, it's definitely has its challenges. You know, I, I have scrubbed out of cases and I have held my phone to the screen and I've recorded a fluoro DSA, sent it over to my partner from my first practice, have sent it to my attendings from Brown. And I've done that. In fact, I did that not too long ago on a repeat UFI case. A lady had a recurrence after 10 years and her anatomy was really different. And I just wanted to make sure. So even the cases I've done a lot of, I still, I just, I have no shame. I scrub out and I say, I'm going to go ask, you know, see what's going on. It doesn't happen often, but definitely being on your island is tough. I am definitely pressing for more awareness for myself and the staff, for example, just basic ACLS or advanced ACLS and any sort of emergency management type thing that we don't have an ICU for or you know anyone to call. So that all is there, encompasses my practice. So I'm thinking about that stuff every day. So to answer your question, it's tough, it's challenging. You have to think in different angles. You have to understand what is needed when you're on your own and what you don't have. And you have to know what you don't know and always try to ask. So I find myself studying more, asking more questions and being a little bit more anxious and worried about every day in a healthy way to say, okay, everyone looks at me at the end of the day and I don't want any bad patient outcomes and I want everyone to be walking out on their own. And so those are all things that I never thought about in a private practice, never thought about in a hospital. I mean, I did, but I always had this kind of comfort of, oh, we have the ICU docs, we have the ER docs. And I think as a young person, you should just try to figure out what you don't know and what you need in an outpatient setting. And I feel like three years out of fellowship, it's a good challenge for me. Uh, it's it's kind of a kick in the butt. Hey, these are the things. You, do you know how to read an EKG now? Do you understand the rhythms? And it's very, you have no reliance on really anybody in the room, which this isn't made for everybody. This I wanted this challenge. I welcomed it as a young IR. I don't know if I would want that like 30 years out. No, and, and you know, knowing when and how to reach out is a skill set in itself, right? I mean, and you only know that you only learn that by trial and error, like who to reach out to, how to, if you have a complication, how to deal with that in the outpatient setting, what hospital to send them to, you know, who's going to help you, who's going to 
not be so helpful. Those things are, yeah, it's, that was really, you know, when I was doing it really kind of kept me up at night because it does all fall on you. Like a quick story. I, I was with my group for four years and, you know, I was kind of known as one of like the laid back IR guys. And then when I, I went outpatient for a couple of years, I was by myself for a little bit of that. And then I came back and one of the techs told me, she was like, you're different. She's like, you're not nearly as laid back as it used to be. And I was like, you're right. Cause I had to like all accountability was on me, you know, and I couldn't, I had to make sure every tech, every nurse, every MA, everybody knew what they were doing. And because when things relax, that's when bad things happen. And so it's just kind of, I mean, it is super stressful. So I, I, I know I, how you feel and, and you're right. It's not for everybody. I mean, I kind of realized that like, it wasn't really for me. <laughs> No. Yeah. And I think getting out of college and working in sales for a dear friend of mine, I'm still close with his company, his startup in DC, that really kind of, I think, grew that fire in me to, it's okay to be challenged. It's okay to be uncomfortable. And I think that's what they tell you in fellowship. Your attendings are like, you need to be uncomfortable every day. You need to just go around on your patients. And we kind of took that for granted at times because we had so much backup in a hospital setting. But now I'm truly uncomfortable. And it's a joyful uncomfort, in my, in my opinion, for now. I'm learning how to be a comprehensive physician every day. And I need to figure out everything. Hey, how, how many doses of the reversal agent you need to give? And how much of this? How much of that? And what is this EKG rhythm? You can't rely on anybody because at the end of the day, uh, the, I'll be, as you know, Aaron, you, you've, you've been in that setting. So you, you got to be careful and you have to be very, very, very aware of everything that's going on in the room from A to Z, in my opinion. Well, I think what you just said is right on that it's not that different from training. That constant anxiety that you felt every day of training or even in fellowship for meals in fellowship was like, I could screw up at any moment. Right. And if I screw up, it's going to be bad. And so you just, yeah, you're trying, you're spending every day trying to prevent that. And you're completely out of your comfort zone for a while. It's, I think it takes a while for people to get to feel like comfortable every day when they're by themselves. Absolutely. And even so exactly, because I don't have a senior partner in the practice. I am the medical director. I am the only one there. I have to know everything that's going on and people rely on me and it's definitely nerve wracking. I mean, it still is. I mean, I go every day, I have this little anxiety, like, you know, but I'm constantly reviewing things in my head. Sometimes when I'm driving to work, I'm like, okay, you know, what is my ACLs protocol? What am I doing? Like if this happens, because I'm always thinking about, because, you know, some of these patients are very sick, especially the dialysis ESRD patients. They're, they're very, very ill. They're very fragile and they don't seem like it when they walk in, but they could, as you know, they could go south very quickly. So I don't want that for my patients. So I am putting myself on the hot seat and it's, uh, you know, helps you lose a little bit of weight with that anxiety, honestly. Yeah. I felt, Constantly I felt, burning calories. Yeah, no, I, exactly. <laughs> I felt the same way about ACLS for the first time. I actually paid attention in the ACLS class. Yeah. I was like, I need to know this yes. cold because you're the one that's going to run a code or whatever's happening, whatever complication. You better. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. it's you. Yeah. You can't you call can't rapid response or, co you know what I mean? No. And the Amos, you know, the funny thing is, that's another thing that we're doing is that's one thing that I pay attention to is during the ACLs course, I was timing everybody and I made sure that everybody's obviously on board with their organization of who's doing what, but also timing. And then I called the um, local EMS in the area and I said, how long? Does because I want to know how long it takes for them. So how long am I running this code for? And they gave me a very night. They were like 15 minutes. Like they had it down to a T. And I said, great. So I told my team, hey, this is going to be a 15 minute ordeal at least. So you just got to think outside the box and be like, all right, what what do I need to know? Like just calling EMS, for example, that was you got to know where they are, when they where they come from, how long does it take them, what their capabilities are. And this is something no doctor would ever think about because you don't even worry about it when you work in a hospital setting. So yes, exactly, exactly, and and it's basically always thinking about what could go wrong. And of course, that's going to cause anxiety. But let's change gears real quick. I want to talk about marketing. You said you had a background in sales and marketing. I know that this is the most important piece of building a practice. What is your strategy as a solo IR and sort of how has this company set you up? Do they expect you to go out one day a week or do they have their own marketing team? Both. I'm actually really excited about the marketing aspect, which is one of the reasons why, one of the many reasons why I took this job. So we have a dedicated marketing team. It's a lady I work with. She's great. She's very energetic. She's been with the company for 10 years or 10 years plus, something like that. And she and I have 
developed a very nice rhythm of which meetings I should be going to and which meetings I don't have to go to, which she can do solo, or which meetings we can just FaceTime in. Like if I'm coming out of a case, she can FaceTime me and she turns the phone and says, hey, I want you to meet so-and-so. And we, with the way we know that information is we've done a lot of ton of market research on which physicians are more higher impact for referrals and which ones are not depending on their volumes. And she's done an outstanding job coming up with those numbers. So we go through a chart. We pick out, kind of cherry pick the meetings I need to go to. The ones I have to go to, I just work around my schedule and I, you know, she comes and picks me up or I meet her there. And I would say it's a nice balance of both. And she sends me weekly reports of who she met with and what's the feedback. And she calls me all the time. Hey, do you have any more literature on prostate artery? This doctor was wondering. I'm like, sure. So I send her. So there's a very good kind of rhythm there with her and great relationship. I'm very blessed because she's very skillful and she's very knowledgeable. If she was new like me, I think there'll be some struggles, but definitely have good guidance from her and my support. So I do a lot of in-person meetings. I think I've done in the past three months, done at least nine with her, nine or 10 in-person meetings. And when I go to these meetings, I try to take my time. I schedule usually about an hour, hour and a half. We provide lunch, which is great for the entire staff. And I sit with the doctors. I try to be kind of use the basic sales skills. Don't be in a rush to leave. Don't try to force information in their brain. Sit down, relax. I pour myself a little drink, you know, a little Diet Coke or something. And I sit and chat with them and give them the comfort of, hey, I'm not here to sell. I'm here to discuss procedures that could give your patients great outcome and build a relationship with you. And that's how I did when I was in sales. When I used to work in sales, the expectation was you're not going to make any money and you're not going to make any meaningful relationship in the first six months. You're just going to have to keep going and be consistent until those relationships develop on their own organically. We're not here for quick cash. We're not here for quick results. We're here to build relationships. And I think that's what I try to focus on with these meetings. And that's just been my mindset. So it's okay if I'm missing two hours of work and I have to move some things around because I'm, I'm making some great time with these docs. And they appreciate that. I think that's more time, FaceTime, they see from any doctor, really, because they work with physicians in the hospital who have no time. Yeah. I mean, like, look, I had sort of a weird marketing situation and it sounds like you get a lot of the support that you need from this company. And you have somebody who's experienced, like been doing it for 10 years. She knows how to have these conversations. She knows how to pull you in when she needs you. It sounds like you guys have a good relation, like that kind of like relationship with your marketer is essential because if you're not on the same wavelength, then she's not bringing referrals in for you right? And vice versa. And I'm very comfortable with marketing as well because of my background. So we kind of mesh so well together. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's huge. And it's great that like you kind of already had that going in because as you know, probably with prior experiences, like finding those people are, is, can be really challenging as well and training them up, especially if they don't have any experience. Some people don't know what IR is, right? A lot of people do. A lot of general practitioners don't know what IR is. And so they, you have to rely on your marketer to even educate them on, this is what Dr. Alakani does. He's imaging guided procedures and A, B, and C, and it's got to be very strategic, right? Because their time is limited and you know, you got to read the room and you got to know, okay, today I'm going to talk about PAD. Next time I might come back and talk about prostate, but we're not going to be able to cover all that in our, you know, the 15 minutes I have with them. And you don't learn that stuff until you're out there doing it. And, you know, sometimes you got to sit, sit in their waiting room for like 45 minutes and it's not convenient, but that's how you win them over too, because it's almost like they're testing you. Absolutely. And we have really kind of strong pamphlets and brochures and business cards. Well, all those basic things are very well done, very well designed, all in color. So I know every detail, in my opinion, marketing matters to make it more comfortable for the physician to understand what you do. And uh, I'm always available. I give out my phone number to all the docs I meet, my cell phone number. And I tell them, you know, use me, abuse me as much as you want. I even tell them one thing I do want to give to the young guys who want to attract, because again, I'm developing this center. The center is not profitable yet. It needs to be. So it's actually at a very fetal stage. Give out your phone number at the same time. Tell them what I do that kind of brings a smile to their faces. I say, listen, I'm also a board certified diagnostic radiologist. If you ever want to run a study by me that you want me to remotely log in and see a CT scan, doesn't have to be for our case. Let me know. And none of them have utilized me, but they all appreciate to have that kind of radiologist on call for them. So it's, hey, can you look at... One of them actually did. It. I, I read like an MRA for somebody. Not read, but I give an opinion. And it took me like five minutes between cases. It doesn't 
just these little integral things really do matter when it comes to marketing to being you got to be available yeah especially i think the gi docs they love to do those curbsides and like go over imaging you know exactly that was actually a gi doc yeah <laughs> i'm telling you man that's why it was yeah. my kids they that's love funny. to get yeah and you're right the cell phone thing is essential and for those people considering this you have to be willing to give out your cell phone i think most irs are but I mean, I don't know. Some people are just kind of weird about that, like, you know, protected time. But even when you're on vacay, like you got to be able to pick up the phone. Yeah. They text you. I was just in Italy for like almost 10 days and I got a couple of texts about patients and I was like, no problem. I was on Wi-Fi sitting in Positano and I was like, yeah, I'll send it over to my lady up front. But I think it's just basic sales tactic. I mean, I've read several books on just how you're supposed to market and giving out your personal information. It's very meaningful to the person receiving it. And it's just something that creates a lot of value in relationship in the relationship that you're developing. And most of these doctors don't even call you or text you. They respect your privacy, respect your time. And so it's like networking 101, right? I mean, like you you don't feel like you yeah, make a connection exactly. unless you get somebody's cell phone. And that should be really, I think, the perspective when you're out there trying to get referrals. Exactly. And another thing about marketing is I always tell my docs that I meet that if you call our center, somebody will pick up. We don't have a kind of an arduous system where press one, press two, press three. If you call my center, my girls will pick up and they will answer you directly and they know. And that's another thing is you got to educate your, your, your front office with regards to what procedures you do, what they're asking for. Because if a GI doc calls and says, I want a hemorrhoid artery, the embolization consult, and it, your lady doesn't know up front, then you're kind of toast in that situation. You have to kind of maybe even rebuild that relationship with that GI doc. So at the same time, they pick up the phone and these docs don't have time. They want to get to a doctor immediately. And I think that's so important. And I think you've talked about this in other podcasts, which I agree with availability of doc to doc conversation yeah. quickly. Right. It's the three A's, right? The availability or accessibility, either one, ability and affability. Yes. So we talked about staffing. It sounds like you're pretty much involved with keeping on top of the staffing, whether or not, you know, you're hiring. Are there any particular positions that you find challenging to hire? I know when we had Krishna Manava on, they were talking about MAs being especially challenging, but have you had any issues? I have an amazing MA. So I, I, my issue right now has been finding a director of nursing. And I think that's kind of the tough one because I want somebody with extensive interventional radiology experience. And at the same time, I need someone who can be an effective leader and somebody that is liked by my entire staff. So all the, there are so many boxes to check for that position. So that's been kind of the challenging one because I have a facility administrator, but sometimes when you know she's not there, I need the director of nursing to be kind of keeping an eye out on how patient management is being done for pre and post procedure situations, because I'm not there all the time. I'm in my office doing work, taking a phone call. So the DON has been tough, but I think, you know, we'll, we'll definitely, we're making some headway on uh, interviews. So hopefully that'll resolve. Yeah. We always had a hard time with techs because the local hospitals pay so much. And especially if you're just nine to five and there's no call, it's like, how do you compete with the hospital jobs? You know what I mean? And we were talking, I was talking to Blake and Jim Melton about this too. And they were kind of saying the same thing. It's just all about, you know, just treating people really well. But yeah, it's, if you're not working the, the same amount of hours because you want everybody to have a better, you know, they have to make that decision. Is it, are you going to work for money or lifestyle? Right. Well, you know, our center, our techs are incentivized to do good work. And I think the way they differentiate themselves from the hospital is not the volume of cases, but if our cases go well and we're able to get through patients safely and effectively and everything, you know, our patient satisfaction scores are great within the company, then there's an incentive for the techs to be bonused. So that's, I think that's, that's a great thing to have in a kind of a entrepreneurial, you know, everybody feels responsible for the case. And I like that, you know, money makes people happy. I understand. And I think if you incentivize people to do good work, pay attention, make sure we're stocked on everything, make sure that the pre and post procedure care is done well. I think it's just human nature that you pay attention more. And I think there's no shame in talking about that saying, you know, there's an incentive to do well financially if our center is doing well with patient care. And I think that's a, that's a great thing. So we have amazing techs, regardless of that incentive. They're very, very good, very experienced techs from the hospital. You know, they've been around for decades. So I've been blessed with that. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about supplies since you just mentioned it. Like when you walked in, were you happy with what they had on the shelves or did you 
come in and make a bunch of changes. Like, you know, you're three years out, so you kind of have an idea of what you prefer, but tell us about like, do you have a freedom of choice to kind of bring in the vendors that, that you enjoy working with? Yes, I do. That's, that's again with the, the you know, entrepreneurship with helper wheels, which is great. So I have support and uh, I didn't make any big changes, but there were definitely some items I wanted to add. And there, the techs and the nurses were used to a certain way from the physician that was there before. So that was a little bit of challenging to kind of bend their ways a little bit and uh, say, hey, this is how I do it. And this is how I like to do it. This is how I was trained. And this is what the new literature says. And uh, that was a little bit challenging, but it all balanced out and still kind of a work in progress right now with that. But uh, yeah, I can basically use any vendor I want as long as my budget, again, supports it. So I'm in charge of that. So if I want to use a certain device during a procedure, I have to know how much it costs. Again, that was another learning kind of step for me to understand cost, understand efficiency and effectiveness of devices, and then I can use whatever. So as far as the center, I have a certain budget that I have to handle and I can use it however I want. So yes and no, I can use whatever I want, but I should be careful and study it well before I do. So that's, again, a great learning opportunity just for anybody in any sort of business to understand the weeds of it and not just work somewhere. Do they give you like a quarterly breakdown? Like, you know, Ali, you spent this much on supplies this month and this is what you brought in and here's your margin. You guys kind of look at that stuff? We have, yes, we actually have access to an internal database that gives us all that information, uh, the P&L statements, balance sheets, everything. So I'm, I'm able to see the quarterly budgets that come in. I sit down with my FA, uh, my facility administrator, and we discuss you know, what we need to do, where we're at. So again, these are all just very, very exciting new things to learn as a young IR, kind of trial by fire kind of thing. So things that I never knew. And uh, I still reach out to my finance guys that I know in my life that are my mentors. And I ask them questions and, hey, what do you think about this? And it's all learning. It's, it's great. So I was reaching out to some colleagues I know who are kind of contemplating doing their own thing or going solo and trying something similar to what you've done. And I told them uh, that I was interviewing you and they had some questions and they have more to do with like the granular stuff. So one of them was billing companies come in different sizes, big and small. Granted, now your company is national and has multiple centers. So I imagine they, do they have their own billing company or do they outsource their billing? From my understanding is we have our own billing company. And the reason is the emails that I see are all from the same company. They're not outside. I have been told we have, I, th I think it's an internal, in my opinion. Have you had any issues with billing? Like, uh, you know, where they kick back stuff? Have you had to justify what you're, you're doing? Any challenges with that? Not yet. They do kick back certain things and they say to modify the report to be more specific. They're actually very good. They read everything and they say, you know, did you have access to one vessel? What did you do? Was it the subclavian vein or was it the axillary vein? And they're very specific. So for the most part, they're very compliant, which I appreciate. They kind of watch my back and I think they're doing a pretty good job. I have not gotten any trouble with them regarding billing. If you don't mind me asking, what EMR do you guys use? We use an internal EMR. It's not. Um, it's a proprietary software. It's called NextGen. I'm not sure if you've used it, but it's something that is built in for our procedures. So I don't dictate anything. I just kind of go and click around. And like, for instance, I do a UFI. A screen comes up that says, "Okay, where'd you get access? You know, right groin. What's the first vessel? Boom, boom, boom. It's all just a clickable, and then you just press generate report, and all of a sudden you have a two-page report, and you just read it quickly, and you make small edits and you sign it. So it's very streamlined. That's amazing. I've not dictated anything wow. in a long time. That is really cool. Except my locums diagnostic jobs. Yeah. <laughs> well, what about like, if you use a specific wire device, you just click the, you know, it's all in part of the report. Yes, they have all of them listed. Yeah. They have like a, you know, Robert's catheter. They have a Cobra. They have all the balloons I use. They have um, all the stents. It's all in the system and they keep getting added fairly well. You know, it's not perfect. But that's so such it's a very a easy saver. system. Yeah, you know, it's huge. Like, I don't really need a PA, honestly, for that. I just bang out reports. Even office visits are very easy. They have, you know, pelvic congestion, UFI, ESRD, first visit, second visit. And, you know, uh, is it established patients, a new patient, blah, blah, blah. It's great. It's very Are easy. you doing any vein stuff? I'm starting to do veins. So I, that's another, actually, that's a very good question. I don't have a full-time vascular ultrasound tech. 
to do all my studies, uh, but I am borrowing one from a different center that's actually 40 miles away. So she comes in once or twice a month and I try to stack up all my vein consults for her to come and just knock them out. And then I see the consults after she sees them. And so that's coming back to life. It was here with the previous physician, but COVID and his retirement kind of wiped it and I have to rebuild it. Yeah. Talk about challenging staffing, finding a good vascular ultrasound tech is, I mean. And they're expensive. So again, budget, do I have the money? Right now, I'm not making the money I need to be making for the center to bring in a full-time because they're expensive. Do you, any issues with them getting you on insurance contract? Like how did they get, did they get you hospital privileges close by in order to get you on insurance contracts? That's a very good question. Insurance contracts, they came through. The only thing I had to do was apply for privileges in the area. And uh, as long as I had an application for privileges for hospitals, that was good enough for the insurance just to say, okay. And uh, I'm still pending. I'd like to have privileges. I haven't been contacted yet. The hospitals in the Maryland area are mostly academic and they're kind of tough to get into. There are some private community ones. So no, you didn't, for my, in my situation, I did not have to have privileges before insurances gave me the green light. They just wanted to see a piece of paper that said, I have applied. Got it. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, so let's say you were to have a complication. Do you have any kind of, like I had an agreement in place with like a local vascular surgeon so that he could help with any issue, any emergencies. I do have two vascular surgeons that I have been building a good relationship with. That's great. How about any, any local IRs that you've had relate? Like that was the other thing is like, I kind of, I knew the local IR. So if I had something that I couldn't handle in the OBL, I would just give them a call and be like, Hey man, you know, this probably should come to the hospital. And, and I think they appreciated that sort of informal partnership. Do you have anything like that with, with your local IRs? I do. I'm developing that, but I do have Johns Hopkins is here. And if I need to send anything to the hospital, I did send a patient that was very complicated, kind of a central venous occlusion and stenosis that I didn't want at angioplasty. Yeah. Reconstruct. Outpatient setting with the, you know, so I didn't want to cause a tamponade and not be able to potentially handle it. So I wanted to, uh, so I reached out and I scheduled her for Hopkins. And that's something that's a luxury to have here. So. I'm appreciative of those guys being around the corner. Yeah, well, that's cool. Do you guys have, have Andrew Club started back up in that area in Maryland? There is, yes. I haven't been able to participate in one yet, just kind of focusing on the center, but there is one, yes. And I actually reached out to a vascular surgeon who is involved in it on Twitter, and uh, he's supposed to let me know, you know, future meetings. So those are nice. Definitely. Just- yeah, that I found helpful because. You know, that's where you can see people in person, you get the, you know, again, the networking and they're all in one place. And then, you know, if you, you can show them what you're doing in the OBL, which is pretty cool. And it's, it's kind of cool for them to see as well. That's why I was just right. curious. That's a very good point. Yeah. Well, man, I mean, it sounds like a great position. I'm actually like really jealous because un- unlike my situation, you have all this support. Like that's what just, when, it, when we were talking before, I really was kind of shocked by how supportive the company is and really kind of giving you the best of both worlds, right? You get that sort of entrepreneurial feel by being your decision maker, you're part of the decisions, but you also, you didn't have to have buy-in, you don't have any financial risk really. And, you know, you get, you make a good paycheck, you have a, a nice, you know, weekends off and so forth. So it sounds like a great position so far. Yeah, it's not definitely not perfect. You know, my center has its challenges. Um, we're trying to have it right now. I'm just kind of split between two centers, my center that's already established and my center. So I'm only working at my center two, maybe three days a week. And then the other two days, I have to go to the other center just to kind of, I don't love that. So the goal right now is to make the center more profitable, to have it open five days a week. So it doesn't really affect me financially, but it does. I'd love to be in my center five days a week and be able to develop it and kind of create better relationship and rapport with the staff and not have them displaced back and forth. So that's definitely one of the biggest challenges. And I, and you know, we're trying to work through that by, you know, by the numbers basically. So, but yeah, overall, I think it's, it's definitely a great opportunity for learning. I think one of the questions you had earlier, I don't know if you remember, you talked about coverage during holidays. I think that could get challenging at times. The reason why it's not as challenging right now for me is because there are a lot of locums guys in the system 
within the company and they travel you know what like for instance when i was overseas last week i had a physician very nice physician from california fly in and cover me for the you know the days that i was gone so it was he saw my post up ufi consults and you know follow-ups and and it was it was great and that's the luxury i have which may not be present when you're out completely on your own island you'll have to bring in guys and you know i think it's a little harder you have to just you know come up with what you want to pay them and you know all that stuff so i think just having this kind of overall system but yeah i think overall it's okay right now it's a good learning opportunity i don't know what the future brings but i'm enjoying it right now i think it's it's definitely a good challenge a healthy challenge for me you mentioned you have to go to this other center. So is there another doc that covers that center primarily? Yes. So there, there's, a, there's a center about 10 miles from my center that is completely established, but not as diversified as my center. It only does you know a few procedures. So I go there and basically do that, but I'm not the medical director there. So it's a little bit of a hybrid system for me. And that's something that hopefully will be fixed once I open up for five days. But you know, I'm spending about 60% of my time at my center and 40% at that center. Okay. So. Well, that's cool because the incentive is really like autonomy, right? So you're trying to get it Correct. so that you your home is 100%, not 60%. Right. Yeah. That's the goal. That's that's the goal for everybody. So, and I think that's important because I want my staff to see me in my way of work instead of traveling back and forth because they do come with me to the other center because that center gets busy when there are two docs there. And then, you know, we have a different way of working there and it's completely different there. But it's not that big of a challenge, but I, I do see that stressing them out a little bit during the, like, oh, well, Dr. So-and-so likes it this way. I'm like, well... Yeah, but we're in our center now, so <laughs> this is right. But, you know, I, you know, I, I just one thing I want to tell people, you know, when you work at these centers, just be happy, smile, and don't take yourself too seriously. Kind of as just a general advice to you know, young, don't have a big ego. Just have fun with your staff. If your staff has an opinion during a case, don't get all worked up that they're wrong. Just, just hear it and just continue to work. And I think that's one thing that I do a lot is just kind of keep a calm environment and make and make it fun for everybody. I'm not there, the big medical director doc. You know, I'm just there to do cases. And I tell people, we're here to take care of patients and we're here to do good work. And, you know, I tell my staff that and just want to make sure they're comfortable. And, you know, if you have a disagreement with them, it's okay. You know, it's not a big deal. And I think that's that's important to also keep in mind, especially as like a young trainee, because you come with a kind of a chip on your shoulder that you want to be this big guy. And, and it's great. Do, do good work and make sure your patients do well. Just be a nice guy, and I think things will be okay. Yeah, we got a. Uh, we're doing an episode in the near future with Peter Horner to talk about staff culture and how important that is, right? Not only for your staff, but for your own mental health, right? Because if you can be the catalyst for the staff culture, it just comes back to you. You know, we all know how contagious like negative energy is, and how it can just ruin a lab, it can ruin a suite, it can ruin a lab, it can ruin a hospital, it can just take over. And so you kind of have to be that catalyst and start the positive energy going and keep it going. And a lot of times there'll be somebody else who will champion that as well. And part of that is finding the right people and hiring the right people. But I think that for longevity's sake, for everyone and for staff retention, for your own retention, it's immensely important and I think commonly overlooked. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right, Aaron, about that. I think it starts with the grassroots of recruitment, which is why I'm very much involved in every interview that I do with whoever, whether it's an MA, whether it's a front office, you know, scheduling person, or I want to be involved. I want to get to know them. I want to create a kind of a consistent ethos for everyone to say, hey, this is our creed and this is what we do here. And if you don't like it, you know, it may not be the best place for you. Again, you have to spend a lot of time doing that. So I don't just have my FA do the interviews. I want to talk to every single person that wants to work. Even we have some part-time nurses, for example, and I want to get to know them. And then at the end of the day, especially the first three to four weeks, I talk to them and say, hey, do you guys have any input? Anything bother you today? Anything I could do better? And I think they really appreciate that. Hey, you know, you got a young doc here who's trying to work with me and not be this, you know. And they also see, that also instills confidence that, hey, this guy's humble enough to ask questions about improvement. And I feel comfortable here. I feel comfortable working here because I have a progressive team. And I think that's really important. Ali, before we finish up, two quick questions. What's your favorite procedure to do? In an outpatient setting or in general? In, in everything, everything you've ever done. What's your favorite? You know, I, I love so many things about the procedures I do. I think embolizations in general, I love doing. But I think the top procedure that I 
really just love doing were stroke thrombectomies, oh, which okay. uh, you know I don't I don't get to yeah. do anymore. But but man, that was a rush of blood that I had literally and figuratively. It was just so much fun with the, you know it's like an almost like an F one race where you're in there and everyone has a they know their role exactly and you know you know uh, brain time is brain so you gotta but that was really fun but I love the embos I'm doing in outpatient setting they're quick they're satisfying and they're very gratifying so yeah what about you what's your favorite I message? love podcasts I, yeah right <laughs> I love filter retrievals I love oh, taking filters you're one out of those yeah guys. yeah I'm the filter out Friday oh guy my God. no I had one the other day where I was so excited. And I get in there, I do my injection, and there's a big hunk and clot in the middle of the filter. And I was like, God damn it, because I didn't get to take it out, you know? I had to leave it in, put it in my anticoagulation, and somebody else is going to take it out three months from now. But no, I like those. What's your favorite? I probably know the answer based off your procedure, but what's your favorite medical device? That's an interesting question. So many Love the Inari. I just the satisfaction <laughs> of getting those clots yeah. out and clearing those pipes. I mean, I mean, I love the Trivo for strokes, but I think the Inari is just great, man. I mean, it's just you just you know you've have you used it before? I've scrubbed down on cases, but I actually haven't done any real PE thrombectomies. I've just helped people, and so I've no, I haven't had much experience with it. PE or like you know peripheral like DVTs, and it's just you just kind of. That's why here, I mean, that everybody I know out. loves it. It's just like, boom, it's like magic. It's great. Yeah, I know everybody, I know everybody on Twitter is like over the clot porn, but you know, it's, I got to, <laughs> yeah. before Anari came along, I would do just catheter thrombectomies and just suck out from the clot. And it was very satisfying. So I imagine like a penumbra. Yeah. yeah or even just a cat, seven French or eight French catheter, just like sucking clot out of, you know, I, I would do that if, if I was at a hospital where I didn't have any devices. Right. I actually have a funny story about filters. One of my favorite things, I was actually just talking to him last night. I'll name him. His name is Brian J. He's a great guy up at Brown. We were doing a call case when I was a fellow in 2018 at Brown. It was like one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. It was just a filter placement that we got muscled into doing emergently. And I think it was a option elite. And you know how they have like two sides, you know, femoral. So we're, he likes to do it femoral. So I was in femoral and we usually did it through the IG, but he's a femoral guy. So I basically put the wrong, I put the jugular oh, end. And he walks out of the room. He's like, all right, go ahead and do it. And then he walks in, I fluoro, the thing is upside down. And he's, I'll never forget. He's like, oh, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> And then, he was just such a nice guy. I mean, this guy goes like tuna fishing. He's got a boat. He's a super, super nice guy. But then he comes and he just snares it to this day. He texted me last night. He's like, how you doing? I was like, good. He's like, going to do a filter. I thought about you. I was like, <laughs> Never again. It was so funny. And then he, he would make me show it to everybody before I put it in moving forward. He was like, make sure two people in the room know which end you're putting yeah. on Ali. And I was like, dude, I, it was just... I just wasn't paying. It's just so funny. He was just like, oh, I was like a disappointed dad. And I look like a complete idiot. I'm like, hey, here's my filter. Right. And it's like, whoop. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's just, it was so funny. Love Brian J. Uh, maybe this will make it on the podcast. You'll hear it. No, this will make definitely make it. I mean, you know, I love Argon. I love what they make. But that's one thing that I always am super careful about for that reason, man. It's like one of those things. I learned. Yeah. That was you learned the wrong way. Yeah. yeah. Brian, to this day, he tell, he's, he's like, I'm telling all the fellows when they come in, the, 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 your picture's on the wall. I was like, great. That's <laughs> your really picture's funny on guy. the wall. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess we have fellow photos With an somewhere. upside down filter <laughs> next to you. Yeah, yeah. My picture's <laughs> upside down. Yeah. <laughs> and it, the funny thing is he snared it. He didn't let me snare it. Oh, I was just like man. so tired. Yeah. Was, <laughs> yeah. Man. It was so bad. But yeah, man, it's been uh, it's fun. Fellowship was fun. Yeah, I miss Phil. So when are you moving to France? Um, oh, so I'll let everybody know. I'm moving to France next Friday. This is actually my last podcast in this office. Back to it was launched out of this office, so it's a little bit nostalgic. But yeah, we're packing everything up and heading to France next Friday, August 5th. And my next podcast, I'll be recording from Paris. From the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> That's right. We'll see what I, I mean. It could be some like crummy little apartment. Hopefully there'll be good Wi-Fi. All right. Well, Ali, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate your insights. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Yeah. This will help people make some decisions for sure. I wish I could have heard this stuff before I uh, went kind of on my own a little bit because it would definitely would have been helpful in making decisions and trying to get that autonomy and trying to be, I guess, a little bit more. I, I think the advice is that kind of, you got to be part of 
the decisions for it to be like truly like a good experience uh if you're going to be out there on your own if you're just showing up knocking out cases and not you know have nothing to do with the staffing has nothing to do with decisions on devices or what kind of patients are coming in the door you got to be part of all that and i think it sounds like that's probably part of the reason why you're you're pretty happy with the job so far yeah and just quickly take the leap of faith you know young guys just do it trust yourself trust in yourself and you don't have much to lose you're young you can always yeah get another job yeah. so. there's plenty of jobs out there. just do it yeah for sure get out there and learn it's like a study abroad almost just go and learn it go and learn how to be on your own all right thanks man thanks so much man appreciate you thank you so much for listening if you haven't already make sure to subscribe rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend if you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.